everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, I mean, today was a, an odd day in Santa Barbara where we shoot the show live. It was raining part of the day, it was sunny part of the day, and then I went to visit this friend of mine, and she lives on a street that, when I got there, there was just like these bevy of workers cutting down all these trees, these magnificent trees that went like just so high in the sky, and they were just so beautiful. And they were just working their way and cutting down all the trees on the street. And then you'd see this incredible tree, and half of it would just be like all the, the limbs were cut off. And then they, you, know, you heard the grinding noise and all that. So I went into her house and I said, well, why are they doing this? I mean, these trees were so magnificent. It was just unbelievable to me that they were cutting them down. I said, were they sick? No. Were they in danger of falling down or falling on someone's house or injuring somebody? No. And then I said, well, what was the problem? Why are these magnificent trees being cut down? And this is a regular suburban neighborhood in, in Santa Barbara, California. And the reason she gave me, and she's been involved in this a long time, and she said she wouldn't allow her trees to be cut down, that the reason that people are having their trees cut down is because it breaks up the sidewalk a little bit. And their kids can't rollerblade on the sidewalk. Now, and interestingly enough, this was a dead-end street. So kids, basically, there were no cars there on that street. So kids could do it in the street or do it other places. And they were cutting down these magnificent trees. Now, whether it's on this suburban street or whether it's the headwaters, I mean, what right do we have as humans to go around doing this? I mean, it's just it's shocking to me. I mean, and you know if people have watched the show before, you know, we say dedicated to the oneness. And what is that oneness? The oneness connects us to all living things. It connects us to the oceans and the dolphins and the trees and the, the redwoods and, and the trees, these magnificent trees that probably have grown for 150 years on, the, on these streets before the people were there, before the, the houses were there. And we feel, because it breaks up our sidewalks a little, that we can cut these trees down to the ground. I mean, it was just, I mean, really, the whole area was like weeping. I mean, that's how I felt when I got there. And all of us, I mean, we just really have to come together and really experience that one. I mean, it's not that we can never cut a tree down. It's not that we can never do anything in the oceans to, to help humankind. But I mean, we have to have a better reason. We have to really experience that connection that we all have to all other living things and, and take the balance, have more balance, have more harmony. Because it's just, it's just unbelievable to me to see what was going on in the street and for the reason there was. And I don't know, I, I just really was affected by it. And, you know, I mean, if people have watched the show before, we know that, that we talk about the connection to that love, that, that thing that keeps us all as one. And one of our guests tonight, uh, W.T. Bill Samsel, is a spiritual teacher. He's a healer. And he has, I, is it a philosophy? Is it an experience? But what he talks about is the law of one. And, and to us, when we heard about Bill and we read his books, was that someone else to come on and to talk about and to share his experience of that connection that would allow us and, and demand of us to treat everything else, every other person, every race, religion, creed, every tree with, with more dignity, with more connection, as if it was ourselves, as if it was our brother. And he's written an extraordinary book, uh, Bill has, The Atlantis Connection, that goes into different aspects of our lives and past lives and how they all connect. And then again, we have someone who's, whose life is connected to that love and, and brings it through in her music. Alana Sweetwater, she's a singer-songwriter. Her new CD is from Beyond the Veil. And she, by her life and her joy and her experience, wants to sh connect more to that and share that connection with others. So tonight's show should just be another chance for us to really know the one. And when we know the one, I guarantee you, we will not treat each other the way we normally do. We will not treat the oceans the way we do, the dolphins, the trees. And, and we can do that, and we can all live in harmony on this incredible gift of a planet, this, this Garden of Eden. And really, I mean, it's just time. It's time we all connected. It's time we all felt that we are all the same love. And so, please join with me tonight, and, and Alana, and Bill, and just open to the experience of that one. 
So please just to uh, relax into to this show tonight. Join me in a short meditation, and then we'll have Alana sing her first song. So please join me. Thank you. So we're going to start tonight's show with uh, Alana Sweetwater doing Grandfather Fly Me Low, and this is written and performed by Alana. So it's magnificent. Just settle in. Just share her love for a while. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Welcome. Hey there, Arwen. How are you doing? Good. So, yeah, you heard the opening. You were <laughs> sitting close by. That's right. So, why don't you talk a little about your experience and what you mean by the law of the one? Let's go right to that. It's all about the law of one, Alan. Um, the law of one is about the interconnectedness of all things. Everything is interconnected. Uh, you were talking about the trees uh, and uh, the reasons why we can... We can uh, 
cut them down, the reason why we can hunt animals, the reason why we can destroy nature. Um, the early Atlantean people believed that, number one, all life is sacred. So this doesn't just mean all human beings, all life, but this means all life. The four-legged, the two-legged, the winged people, people of the waters. And so this has to be honored. Now before they went on a hunt to, to gather food, whatever, they had to make ceremony, they had to make prayers, they had to ask the spirit world if it was all right for them to perform the sacred act, which was the taking of a life. Only to serve their life, to Only feed or clothe or exactly not frivolous or no. rollerblading or not to not to <laughs> generally they didn't it. rollerblade on <laughs> the reservation. It was not one of the more right. But when you can stop, when you stop to consider that that the gift of life is the gift that the Creator gives, and only the Creator gives this gift, and only the Creator takes this gift away. Now, if you want to hunt and you have to eat or you have to farm or you want to build a community, you have to do the proper ritual and ceremony to make this act, you know, acceptable. And, and this is what we have to understand today, that if it has life, it is sacred and we have to honor that, okay? So if the trees are in the way and then we want to cut down the trees, well, I don't think the early Atlantean people would do something like that. What they used to do is they would build the architecture around the natural environment. Okay, so if a tree was standing there, and it was a big tree, an ancient tree, that grandfather would have to be left there, and they would build around it. So yeah, in harmony with in it, in harmony than, with it, ex know, just exactly, exactly. disregard of it. You know, just get rid of the things that have got their right. way. So th this is one of the uh, the ancient truths of the law of one, is that all life is sacred, and it must be honored. And if you're going to take life, then there's a way that you have to go about doing that. There are ceremonies, there are rituals that you have to perform. Just a recognition, I exactly. mean, whether you do the ritual or not, just to have that recognition internally that... Exactly. I mean, you're the rituals teach you that recognition. Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. Look at the Native American Indians. Before they went on a buffalo hunt, that whole day prior to that, they were making prayers. They were asking uh, permission to to carry on uh, taking of a life and uh, so you see that example right there with the Native Americans actually the Native American people and your tribal people are the ones who have best preserved the law of one except at the gambling casinos well now it's a whole different story isn't things it are <laughs> that's where it's right. where a strange time yeah, that's history. right that's right so I mean as a theory, you know, it's fine, but how, how did you in your life and how, you know, how would you recommend that people have the experience of the one? Because until you have the experience of the one, then it's just oh. an idea. The experience of the one is what I call the journey of the seventh direction. And uh, Einstein said at one point, he said that all learning is but remembering. And Jesus Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Um, we are raised and we're taught uh, in our modern society that everything we want, everything that we're looking for is out there somewhere. It's something external, which is 180 degrees different from the law of one, which says everything is within here. And so if you can begin on this journey of the seventh direction and take the journey inward, everything is in there. And that's the same in all spiritual tests. I mean, exactly. you have to experience exactly. God within, yourself within, I am within. Right, exactly. You don't have to go to a church. You don't have to have a priest or someone to act as a go-between between you and the Creator. See, because that's, it, it's right in here and you can experience that. And if you want to talk to the Creator, you simply do so. You can go out into the woods, you can go out to the seaside, you can go to a park, you can go out in your backyard and commune with 
the creator. So this is something that... Or in your own house, or in a so. dark room, or exactly. in a television studio. Any place you happen to be. Yeah, you, you know that story about Muhammad, he was sleeping with his feet towards like the holy temple uh -huh. and the police came up to him and said, you know, you can't be doing this Muhammad, you know, Muhammad said, well you show me a place where God isn't and I'll put my feet in that direction. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, it's just to, to have that, to know that connection and how to experience that connection. Exactly, exactly. So, so I mean, what was your journey on that? How did that, you know, you were a guy, you were from St. Louis, right? I'm from, from St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did that happen for you? How did you come into that experience? Oh, well, I was looking for something to do. I was bored and I had nothing to do. And I was looking through a newspaper and I saw an ad in the newspaper and it said past life regressions. So I said, hey, here's Love. something that ought to be different. And I went, uh, made an appointment, I had this past life regression. And I didn't think too much about it, actually, but uh, a few weeks later, in my dreams, uh, I would start to receive visions of places and people and things that I had I never experienced before. That you, you hadn't remembered experiencing exactly. this body. Exactly. Uh, I started to get information. I would just be sitting there minding my own business and all the next thing you know, information starts coming in. And after a while, I started to write this stuff down. And I got a little tape recorder and I started to tape record these, in, this information. A few months after that, when I went back to read what I had gotten there, uh, I said, well, and in other words, you weren't right. really a spiritual seeker in that way. You were just bored. And I was, well, were you were you hungry to know? Did you know that there was something more available in a way? Well, at that point in time, I was working in a factory and I was just doing the game like everybody else. And uh, but there, there was some hunger in you, a little bit, or some you know when I discontent. Would, would you call it? Uh, yeah, discontent with, with being, uh, um, living in economic slavery, uh, working at a job that I didn't like, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. But, um, <clears throat> the information, uh, that came in when I read it back, it made all the sense in the world. When I was sitting there reading that newspaper before I went for the, uh, for the past life regression, I was looking at the paper and I heard a little voice in the back of my head that goes, this could very well change your life. And I said to myself, well, where'd that come from? What's that? Uh, since those days, I look back at my life and I can see how everything has led up events in my life. Mm -hmm. and things that have taken place in my life to lead me up to what I'm doing today. So there was a point in my life that I reached where spirit said, hey, now it's time for you to wake up. So we're going to send you to get this little past life regression and that's going to wake you up and, and you've got work to do. Right, that's going to change the momentum of your life. And exactly. Move you in another yeah, direction. Exactly. Like, seemingly. Right. And the result of all this is the Atlantis Connection, the book. And did that, did that, does that start with the information that was starting to come exactly. after the... Exactly. At first I thought this was all channeled because I had read about channeling and what channeling is. But I never really thought too much about channeling. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that's uh, questionable. Mm -hmm. you know. But um, since then, I've discovered that it's not channeling that I'm doing. It's remembering. Mm -hmm. what I'm doing because I've had three separate incarnations three separate lifetimes in a place called Atlantis and that's the the book is a result of, of that remembering these things and putting them down in this book and the book's doing very well right now actually it's it's um, going out there and then sales are picking up and yeah, there's a lot of interest in Atlantis and oh, Mary yes. and oh yes and now how does that connect okay we can know about Atlantis and you know, whatever, we'll talk about that maybe in a second. Sure. But, I mean, how does that relate to the law of the one? How does that relate to us in the 20 or whatever, the 21st century? I can't even know what century we're in. So. Well, 
you know, Edgar Casey talks about the law of one, and Ruth Montgomery talked about the law of one, and uh, John Pino has written a book called The Lost Teachings of the Law of One. But you could say that the law of one is uh, the ancient, unalterable, universal truths that uh, all religions are based on. All religions teach aspects of the law of one. Only uh, they've been altered through our Throughout recorded history. history well, do the, you think it's because the master or the, the, the beginner of it had an experience of that, and then as you go on and people aren't having the experience, then it becomes doctrine, it becomes ritual, it becomes... But it doesn't have the heart of it because it doesn't have the experience of it. Right. It, it, it's, it's, it's something that is felt in here. Um, like I said, you could call it, you could call it original religion, mm -hmm. because uh, the Lemurians practiced it. The Atlanteans, early Atlanteans, picked it up from them. It goes way, 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 way back. Uh, basically, if all the religions were operating from the law of one, then all the different religions in the world would be able to coexist together in harmony. Uh, unfortunately, like I've said, religion has been uh, altered to fit uh, the agenda of the church, the different churches, the different powers, the different governments. So uh, you, you wind up with Christians wanting to, to kill Muslims, and you find... Uh, Christians wanting to kill other Christians. Exactly. There's, you know, there are holy wars throughout history exactly. because you're, you're not following the, the right way the by this much. Right, right. You change I mean, one word. I mean, it's just really, it's almost unbelievable. Exactly. You change one word and the whole thing means something different. Right. You know. But uh, Law of One is original religion. It's, it's the way uh, our ancestors, all the way back 100,000 years ago, were making prayers. And they were very plugged into the spirit world. They were very plugged into it. It was nothing for them to, to communicate telepathically. So why do you think, or, or what is your information about how did that turn for a human being where we used to have all these gifts and powers and, and that recognition and that remembrance and that connection to Law of One to now where, you know, show me a dolphin, I'll eat it, show me a tree, I'll cut it. You know, I mean, exactly. how did we get there? How did that happen? What was the oh. process for us? It's, it's a, it, was, it was a complicated uh, uh, process. Um, at one point in time, we were uh, exposed, uh, had our first exposure to our other relations out there, the extraterrestrial races from other places in the universe. And uh, they had a great influence on Atlantis. Atlantis went from law of one to technology. And they forgot all about the law of one. How does that happen? How do you how do you, you forget it? I mean, it just does it happen overnight? Does it happen slowly it's, but surely? It's 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 a it's a, a, a gradual thing. Um, uh, generations uh, don't like our generation. We grew up with the automobile and the television and the radio and the computers and well, not the computers until lately. Right, right. But uh, we're we are we are used to these things. These things are. This is normal. No, I understand how know any you, other know, way. you and I got screwed right. up, or state, you know what? How that process. Right. But but how did people who had that experience, say the Atlantans, or you know, how did they go from the law of one to not that? How did you know what? What's the, the the process. The process. Again, we made contact with our extraterrestrial relations. We, if that happened today, we would consider that to be the dawn of a new age, wouldn't we? Well, and when it happened 50,000 years ago, the people said, oh, this is a dawn of a new age. Everything's going to be different now. Everything's going to be better. So with the technology that was introduced, they, the, our, our extraterrestrial relations introduced technology to us and gave us certain technology to see what we would do with it, to observe what we would do with this technology and where we would, would it take us. Um, the process of losing your connection to the law of one is a gradual thing that took place. As more technology was introduced, as greed was introduced, as wealth was introduced. Now, as how does that get introduced? How does that? Because 
I mean, how does like private property get into you know all those kinds of things that that seem to evolve us away from the experience of Atlantis developed two two, two polarities. Let's say you had the polarity that would be positive, would be law one. And you had another polarity which would be negative, that would be what I call the Temple of the Sun, or the Sons of Belial. Okay? Um, the Temple of the One Law was your primary uh, religion at one time in Atlantis. Right. And then we set up the Temple of the Sun. This is the Temple of Unlimited Abundance. Everything is unlimited. We can have as much of, of technology, as much of, of anything that we want. And this is where we start to lose it. This is where we begin to develop the greed. This is where we begin to develop the, the uh, lust for power, uh, materialism, all these things. So it's a gradual thing that takes place. Uh, you look at your Native American Indian tribes today. They were living the law of one 200 years ago. Today, it's a whole different story, right? See, they're they're doing the the casino thing and everything now. Right. So, it's it's that same thing. It, it's a gradual thing that happens over time. Okay. And as more technology is introduced, we leave the law of one behind. Okay. Again. Now it seems to me that we're coming back into the law of one with more and more technology. So it's almost like you know a cycle. Have you experienced information on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another truth of the law of one is that time is cyclic. Everything happens in cycles. See, today we believe that everything is linear. Time is linear. It starts here and it, it proceeds in this direction. Right. But if you ask a Native American Indian, and he'll tell you everything happens in a circle. Everything is, is in a circle. That's why the circle is a sacred symbol. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, today, uh, again, if you look at the Native American people, these are the people who have best preserved the law of one down through all this time, through these ages. If you look at them, you'll, you'll find many of the truths, many of the old ancient teachings, uh, many of the uh, universal, unalterable truths of the law of one have been preserved by the Native American Indians. Not only them, but by the Africans, by the South American Indians, by the Aborigines in Australia, all your tribal people have these truths embedded in their culture and their spirituality. So I would say that's that's the best place to look if you're looking for the law of one. If you're looking outside. Right. If you can look inside. If you might, look inside. Might be better well, off. you can find the clues. How to, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. You All go. right, so I guess uh, maybe we're ready for Alana's second set. Right. Uh, we're going to do uh, Mountain Song and Curtain's Call, uh, both written and performed by Alana. So uh, whenever she's ready, just settle in. These are two incredibly beautiful songs. We heard them during the sound check. Uh, and just, just let your heart open to these songs. So whenever Alana's ready. But I 
Wow, thank you, Alana. That was beautiful. Thank you. So we're back with Bill. Hi, Bill. So, so you were getting this information, and the information was specifically about Atlantis and what was going on then, yeah. and and a lot of it was how it relates to now and what we sure. can learn from that period. Sure. sure. Yeah. So why don't you talk about that a little? Well, uh, the Atlantean people uh, began started out as very close to the earth there they they were very much like you would think uh, Native American uh, Indians uh, they they remain that way for thousands of years but um, eventually they, they went with technology they they developed a society that was very much like like we experience today they had the automobiles and the, and the telephones and TV and, and rocket ships and all these things that we enjoy today. Um, time, however, being cyclic, things happen in that manner. They happen over and over again. Civilizations rise, civilizations fall, new civilizations rise and fall in their place. we've come full circle the human race has come full circle and we are now at the same point that the atlantean empire was at at the point of its destruction uh during great war they their weapons literally turned on themselves and they destroyed themselves we are at this millennial point here at this transition point and we're being asked uh, we're being forced, actually, to make up our minds about some very uh, serious questions. Uh, how we do things, how we think, how we look at the world, how we look at other people. Uh, we, well, we, why don't you list some of those questions? Just wh okay. What do you think the questions we're being asked or demanded to be <laughs> dealt with in this way? Well, one of the things is, do we actually believe that the technology is going to solve all of our problems? And that technology can solve all of our problems. Um, a technological society is the easiest society to do away with. See? Because there's, everything is so interdependent on everything else. Um, another question that we have to face is, is are we going to clean up our technology? Are we going to clean up our uh, consumer lifestyle uh, to where we have more respect for the Mother Earth? Uh, this is another question because the early Atlantean people believed that the Earth is a living thing. And if you can, if, if, if you change your thinking to the point where you believe that the earth is a living thing, then you have a whole different outlook on the natural world. And how we interact and with it. And how we interact with it. Um, Mother Earth provides us with everything we need. I mean, these television cameras, the rocket ships that take astronauts into space, these are all from Mother Earth. But we seem to have forgotten that. We've forgotten that, and 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 we've we believe that we can pollute and pollute, and take and take without giving anything back and without any second thoughts. But um, uh, a lot of people are expecting Earth changes to take place, and they very well might. Now that's another question that we have to deal with. How are we going? To, how are we going to change the way we relate to Mother Earth? How are we going to change the way we relate to the other creatures that we share existence on this planet with? Because they are our relations. Alana sang a song, and I heard her going, uh, we are all related, metakoyase, which is Lakota Sioux, for we are all related. Uh, we have to understand this, and we have to, to, to do something about the way that we relate to other creatures in the world. Uh, these are all questions that we're going to have to deal with coming up very shortly now. How can we continue to overpopulate the planet with our own species and expect to, uh, to continue uh, on into the future as well? Um, 
these are questions that we are going to have to deal with coming up in the new millennium. We are in a transition period right now. And the book deals with a lot of these things. The book points these things out. And uh, it's... It, it, you know, the, the thing about, uh, about the book is that it's going out there and it's changing the way people think. And it's changing their lives. And I've talked to a lot, of, a lot of different people that have come back to me and said, oh, you know, before I read this book, I, I didn't understand. I was confused. I didn't know what to make of this or that or the other thing. And reading this gives me a whole different perspective, a whole different viewpoint. So it makes me feel good that, you know, it's going out there and it's doing what Spirit said it would do. And it's to make people think and to give them another way of looking at the world around them. And that's, that's very, very, oh, how would you say, uh, satisfying here to, to know that you're doing that, you know. So uh, it's decision time for the human race. And uh, Mother Earth and, and Spirit World, and they're all sitting there, and they're, they're watching to see what we're going to do. Just like uh, 50,000 years ago, there's a lot of uh, other people interested in what we're going to do. So we have some choices to make. So, um, as people read this book, um, I've heard from many people that they, they'll read it and it'll change something, something will click inside them and then they'll go and they'll tell their friends about it and their friends will go out and get the book and they'll bring it home. And the same thing happens to them, something clicks, you know, and it wakes them yeah, up. Yeah, there's more and more of that. I mean, there's just, I mean, we were talking the other day how like we're in a unique position here on the show that, you know, I mean, we get books and tapes and CDs from all mm -hmm. over the world and it just, you know, I mean, I mean, you're well known in some circles, but you're not like, you sure. know, yeah, yeah, a yeah. common name that oh, Bill. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and there are just extraordinary people who are getting extraordinary information, oh, extraordinary yeah. experience, and they're yeah. sharing that, and that's going out and out. And you know, we see that you know that circle of of love and circle of energy and circle mm. of consciousness really spreading. Well, that's that's my mission. I mean, that's what I'm all about is to help to reintroduce the law of one mm -hmm. to people. Now you, you, you live in Sedona, Arizona, and you take people, you run workshops and take oh. people out into the, to yeah. the wilderness yeah. and hopefully they can connect to that, oh, sure. to that experience. You, you've you been there? Have you been to Sedona? Sedona's it's fantastic. Oh. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is a powerful place and you've heard of the vortexes. The vortex, is that saying that right? Vortex, vortai, vortices. Um, very powerful earth energy, spiritual energy, and it can make a difference in, in someone's life. And that's why so many people go to Sedona. But we, we do the Truth Seekers Workshop, and uh, we take people out into the canyons, we take them to the Indian ruin sites, we take them to the vortex sites, we do meditations, we teach different meditation techniques to people. Uh, give them prescriptions for healing stones and meditations. Uh, we do clearing, we do shamanic healing on them. Uh, we teach them the law of one and what the, the basic truths of the law of one are. And it's like, it's like giving them a key. Because once you, once you spark a flame in that person, they go on from there. They're set into motion and they're on their pathway and right. things are happening for them. And that's really exciting when that happens. We do the fire ceremony, which is an ancient, ancient Atlantean uh, way of making prayers. In the sacred circle, a ceremonial circle, with a fire in the center, out in the middle of the desert out there. Uh, we do fire ceremonies and we've had people in there from Germany and Japan and, and Uruguay and, and South America and all over the Brooklyn, world. New in Brooklyn, New York, yeah. yeah. Jersey even. New no, Jersey. Uh, <laughs> you're making that up, Phil. I, you're exaggerating now. Uh, but I tell you what, uh, these people, you know, before they, you take them out in the desert to do the ceremony. And uh, maybe you've got a group of 10 or 20 people, but they're all a little bit nervous. You know, all a little, they don't know what to expect. Right, right. But you tell them what the ceremony is, 
You put them in the ceremony, you perform the ceremony, and when they come out of that circle, they are fired up, they're charged up, they're excited, they want to ask questions, they want to know this, they want to know, they're ready to go. And it's, it's like launching them, you know, and, and from there it's just wide open for them. Right. You know, it's 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 wonderful to be able to 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 do this to, to to help people in this way, because there's so much bad things going on out there. There's so much disinformation going on out there, you know. And there's so many different people out there that are looking to just to, to take your money away from you, you know, and you go away with nothing. But but this this is this is really it's 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 good to be able to do this you know and, and see the results that that take place and do you find more and more people being open to it and, and finding their way to you or others like you who oh, are sure oh yeah yeah there are people who have come uh, into Sedona and uh, they they are led they, they tell me oh, you know spirit led me here spirit told me you got to go to this ceremony you got to just see this man you should buy this book you know and it's 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 like spirit is leading them you know to this uh, program that we do so um, yeah it's wonderful it is wonderful so I'm all happy about it I'm very excited about so it. Uh, I mean is this this one book, The Atlantis Connection, I mean, is that all the information you're getting that you're writing down, or is there going to be Atlantis Connection 2 um, and 3 and 9 and I'm, 72? No, and the, the, the Atlantis Connection, Beyond the Myth and Legend, uh, is, is the first book that, that I've written. Now I'm working on another one. You are. I'm working on another one. Uh, the first one deals with the early Atlanteans, because there were three ages of Atlantis. Uh, this deals with the early Atlantean people who were very connected to the earth, very connected to spirit world, and they looked very much like your tribal peoples that you still see in the world today. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next book is going to deal with the empire and how the empire came about and how the empire was destroyed. So we're going to look at that a lot more closely because. Actually, if you look at the world around you today, you see that what is happening is the powers that be are attempting to reinstitute or uh, rebirth the old Atlantean Empire, a global empire, a global one world economy, a one world religion, one world military, one world government. This is the old ancient Atlantean Empire the greatest empire the world has ever known. And now we're in the process of rebirthing it, bringing it back into existence. And we have to watch out for that, because uh, that, can, that can be very, that's, that's not what we want to do right now. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of you know, different ep epochs, E-P-O-C-H, in history. Mm -hmm. Now, is there any reason that you've been given why you were focused, or your information is from the Atlantean period. I mean, there are a lot of extraordinary periods throughout history. Why sure. does that one so closely relate to America or the world at this time? Is that what your information is about? Yes, it, it directly relates to, to America. Uh, and I explain in the book how, how this is. Um, it's a little lengthy to go into right now. But um, again, time is cyclic and things happen over again. You, you know about karma, and you know how karma works, that you have to do it over and over and over again until you get it right. Well, we're at that point again. And uh, the reason Atlantis is because Atlantis was the first great power. Atlantis was the first great civilization on this planet. And it goes way back, we're talking about 80,000 years now. See, our ancestors were Atlantean. And uh, it plays a big part in what's going on today. Now, I know a lot of people out there don't believe that Atlantis ever existed. And there's a lot of people out there that don't want you to know that Atlantis ever existed. Uh, because if they had to uh, acknowledge that it ever existed, we have to change our religious teachings, we have to change our history, we have to, it'll cause such a big upheaval. The same thing as if we had to, uh, as if they had to uh, acknowledge that there were other relations from other stars. It would cause 
great upheaval in our society, in our government, in our religious beliefs and everything. So Atlantis is one of those things that they don't want you to know actually existed. Okay. Is your information that, uh, let's say, the powers that be, right. they, they, the whole, the whole they, they, them, uh, right. <laughs> the government, uh, you know, right. they know about Atlantis. Oh, sure they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they have time capsules. They have uh, archaeological finds that they've made. They and have, this has uh, been on land or underwater? Or? Uh, both. 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 Well, see, Atlantis. And where the uh, evidence is inconclusive that there was a civilization that called itself Atlantis. Well, that's what they would have you believe, yeah. But there are discoveries that have been made in the Atlantic Ocean. At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, they discovered pyramids down there, the roads, temples, uh, lots of things down there, and nobody knows about it. But I've read different reports and, and, and information that, that uh, these things are there. Yet they'll continue to look all over the planet in Iceland and Greenland and in Southern America and in the Ural Mountains and wherever else that they claim that they have found evidence of Atlantis. But one thing they don't understand, one thing they keep forgetting, is that Atlantis was a world empire, a global empire. So, of course, you're going to find some relics here, some relics there, some relics in another place, because they were all over the place. This was I mean, was there a capital that was... The Supposedly capital. destroyed and oh, underwater. Sure, yeah, the, uh, the, the city of Poseidon, the great city that, of Poseidon that uh, Plato uh, talked about, that he described. Uh, the great city of Poseidon, the greatest city this planet has ever known. And it was on the Isle of Poseidia. Uh, there were three Atlantic islands, and they were right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, when they had the Great War at the end of the Second Atlantean Age, and they blew themselves to smithereens, they opened up the fault that is that runs right through the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, what they did was they tried to use their super weapon as a destructive weapon to shoot through the Earth, use the Earth as a conductor, and hit the Chinese, what we call the Chinese, from underground and cause earthquakes and land movements and storms and, and uh, volcanoes to go off. And when they did this, it reflected back at them. So yeah, it's right there where it's supposed to be, where Edgar Casey places it, right in the center of the Atlantic Ocean, right where it belongs, right where Plato said it was. So it's there. There's not much left of it, but it's there. <laughs> and, and and the important thing for us, 21st century world, 21st century America, right. is the parallels to it and to learn from the mistakes. Exactly. exactly. You know, I tell people that you don't have to take my word for it. You know, I'm, I'm sure I was there. I know it existed. But you don't have to take it that it existed. You don't even have to believe in Atlantis, even if you think it's nothing but a story. Look at the story. Right, see and then the look at what we're doing today, right. make the parallels. Right. Well, I guess, you know, we've done it again. <laughs> What's so that? The time's up. <laughs> we've done it again. Isn't that amazing? I know the hour goes by really fast. Oh, so, yeah. you know, everybody's just having such a nice time. So, uh, again, you know, thank you so much for coming. I hope you had an experience. I hope you had an experience of the law of one, the experience of one dedicated to the oneness, the experience of love, truth, and that's what the, the show is about. We're going to have shows every week in some cities. If you want any information about Alana, about Bill, 805-687-2053. That's 805-687-2053. We really appreciate all your input. We appreciate the love that you give us all over the world. It's just really important for us. So thank you. Good night. God bless you. Come again. Good night. <laughs>